Hello and welcome to the Back in Black podcast with Rodney and Gavin. Me being Gavin, Rodney being Rodney. Ha! Here and we are. This is the Back in Black podcast. Uh, this is coming out late, um, mostly due to Gavin. Um, I think we get attributed what ended up being about seven millionths of a percentage point of blame towards me. Um, and that has been a decided upon amount. So without further ado, we should continue into the agenda here. Just going to talk about that two deeps and, uh, and, and what we're, we, we maybe expected or didn't expect there with the, the week one, two deeps that came out. Um, we're going to talk about last week's big results, uh, especially Florida state, the top 10 team going down in Ireland to a scrappy Georgia tech team. And we'll talk about most overhyped teams in the AP poll. Who do we think might drop out at the end of this week? Who has the best chance of dropping out? And finally, we're going to pick some games, talk some upsets. So without further ado, let's jump right into the two deeps here. So the two deeps came out for week one. Gavin, I have a couple of players with some arrows here. Any thoughts? Yeah, uh, immediately when I looked at this, uh name that jumped out to me was Jerry Bowie, and that's just because I had no idea who this guy was. I see that he wears the number zero. That's kind of fun, but yeah, that's someone uh, I'd like to know some more about for sure. Yeah, played last year in uh, under four games. We were able to use the red shirt on him. Um, definitely uh, uh, going to be a, a good player, hopefully for us. But right now, in terms of looking at receiver, it's not exactly. A bright spot on this too deep. Certainly is not. Especially with the absence of Caleb Brown, who, as we know, yep. got suspended for a DUI. Another person I want to touch base on here is Seth Anderson losing the starting job to Caden Weichin. Uh Of course, Weichin took over punt return duties after Cooper DeGene was injured last year. Um, so, obviously, he's uh, a speedster. Yeah, very athletic guy. But to see Seth Anderson, who was a highly sought-after transfer, uh, be pushed down to that second string spot. It's troubling to see, in my opinion, um, and what that means for his future as well. Well, I think uh, we can still be certain he's going to get some reps out there. And I mean, you can really make a difference by what you do on the field. So I think that's just a, a little Tim Lester quirk that we're going to see and kind of see what he's thinking to. To, to do with this offense. A hundred and ten percent. And then uh, moving down the line here, obviously Cade McNamara will be starting. Um we have there's no question that, that that was the right decision for the coaching staff to make. Um, you know, obviously high hopes from both of us on uh on Cade this year. But especially what jumps out to me here is is, is redshirt freshman Kamari Moulton making a jump up to mm-hmm. first string running back. Very very surprising. I was really not expecting that. I mean, LaShawn Williams was a, was a weapon, a bowling ball last year. And to see him behind Kamari Moulton is very surprising. Um, Caleb Johnson also started last year um, several games. He gets pushed on the third string. And uh, a guy who I've, I've, you know, I've been high on and, and a guy who made a bunch of big plays for us last year, Jazz Patterson, fourth string. Definitely something to watch for mm. is that running back position. And we do actually see our fifth string running back from last year, Terrell Washington Jr. there as on the two deeps at receiver. Obviously, they decided to make that make that move for Terrell to try to get him a chance to get on the field more because obviously waiting behind a lot of very talented running backs, and he's very talented in his own right. Um, so that's something to be looking out for as well, maybe the use of him on speed sweeps, fly sweeps, motion, you know, whatever I can even Tim Lester is going to throw out at uh, at defenses. Brilliant way to put it. Got it. Uh, moving on to the other side, I mean, not a lot of questions here, right? I mean, we, we know that we have the depth of D-line this year. We have uh, all of the pieces that we need, especially in, the, in, the, in that front seven. But even, you know, looking at John Nestor, who I have here, backup – to Sebastian Castro at the cast position. Um, Going to be a fantastic player. You know, only a sophomore. Be able to 
to learn that role this year and really just have a smooth transition into being that starting cash guy next year. Mm -hmm. And that's just how Phil Parker does it. I mean, he, you, you get one big guy go and, and there's just always somebody right behind him, just ready to dominate on the defensive side of the football. Absolutely. And I think Nestor is going to be that guy in a couple of seasons. Uh, got a new punter this year, obviously Torrey Taylor now making the Chicago bears roster. Um, we wish him the best of luck there uh, as a as a Bears fan. I hope I don't have to see him too often this year, um, but we probably will be seeing him quite a bit. Yeah, you'll be seeing him very, very many times, and uh, I'll be excited to see him play against our, our Packers, you know? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but we have Reese Dakin now coming in f- straight from, uh, from down under. Excited to see how uh, – how that transition will be if there's going to be any bumps in the road uh, or if LeVar Woods will have that all ready to roll. Well, you know, he's a, he's another product of uh, what's that kicking institution that trains all these kickers? Oh, what's fuck. That called? Yeah. Anyways, the kicker camp that uh, yes, all of these 100%. Australian quarterbacks come from. P- uh, punters. Plungers, yes, sorry, my apologies. I'm, uh, no, you're good. I got, I got kick on my brain because it's called kick something. We're going to talk about a couple games here from last week. Uh, specifically, first off, the top 10 team going down in Florida State on a walk-off field goal in what was a, a fantastic game. I want to really direct your attention here to a couple of things, Gavin. Look at the times on all three of those drives in the fourth quarter. I mean, it's pretty clear here that Georgia Tech was simply – dominating the clock i like what you're saying with that you know florida state started off a bang took that opening drive down the field went on uh, the swinging gate got a two-point play and maybe people thought they were going to coast but georgia tech scrappy win ran the football all over florida state's defense florida state's defense gashed all day by georgia tech's running game they used the their quarterback uh jamal uh or sorry not jamal hands that'd be their running back they used their uh quarterback Haynes King in a lot of uh, creative ways on the ground game and um, I, I I definitely appreciated their gutsiness down the stretch you know they got they had a high snap and it took them out of field goal range and they stayed composed picked up the yards they needed to mm-hmm. put their kicker in a spot to succeed and uh, and I think when uh, next week's AP poll comes out on Tuesday we might be seeing Georgia Tech making an appearance in the rankings I, and I think that'd be very deserved I mean that Haynes King's performance in that game was stupendous i mean they said the guy threw how many picks last year quite a few like quite a few picks anyways his i mean he made things happen and he went 11 of 16 i mean nice safe game no touchdowns but also no interceptions and he really he really ensured that win and they were able to lean on that ground game in the second half they were they were but i mean when you when you have a when you have a quarterback that doesn't make mistakes I think uh, I think that's a, a great aspect to their team, you know. And I think they I think they would deserve a spot in the top twenty-five. And now we will move on to Montana State defeating New Mexico in what was a crazy game. Montana State was down by seventeen points at two separate instances in this football game, and they were still able to win it seven or as you see twenty-one points in the fourth quarter, including two touchdowns in the last five minutes. Mm-hmm. A 93 yard run of it, a methodical 89 yard drive to win the game. And that's just, uh, you know, with, with our predictions for that game, um, like we had mentioned, uh, we had thought that, uh, Montana state was going to dominate. You actually took New Mexico by in the points. So you would be correct in that instance. Yep. Um, and we did see Montana state though. What was the better team end up, you know, fighting what ended up being, if you look at this box score, two scooping scores for New Mexico. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you make mistakes like that, and usually you don't come out with a win. But exactly. uh, Montana State really showed their superiority, especially in the stretch. Especially. I mean, 30, 37 second drive with yeah, one four play. and a half minutes left in the game. One play. I mean, yeah, one play. It's it That's ridiculous. Needed to happen. And most importantly, I think, is they. New Mexico's offense did not score any points in the second half. Their defense made adjustments at halftime. They came out looking like they wanted to win the game, and they did end up 
winning the game. And the last game we'll talk about from last week, we got SMU completing an 11.4th quarter comeback, including a safety. Um, I mean, another late touchdown there. But I will say Nevada, who was picked to the last, dead last in the Mountain West Conference, um, came out and their quarterback, Brendan Lewis, as you can see in that box score, leading rusher, threw the ball, was uh, protected the, the football, no turnovers. Um, and I think that, that could be a bright spot. Maybe Nevada will win some more games than people thought they were going to this year. I think they certainly will. It's a very commendable performance from a, a team that was thought to be extremely bad and was, I think, in the FBI had a 1% chance to win this game. Something like that. And, and they, they almost pulled it off. They fought. Um, turning it over to the other side, though, SMU who was uh, 29th in the preseason AP poll with the receiving votes, did not look like they were ready to come into a power conference like the ACC and come in and win football games and contend for that conference like many people thought that they would be this year. So that's just something to keep your eye out on this year is, is, is SMU, can they make some adjustments, especially on the offensive side of the ball? I mean, their offense was miserable in the first half getting their quarterback into more of a rhythm and they, cleaning up the penalties and the mistakes. I believe they had a player um, actually ejected from this game for spitting on an opponent. So, I mean, obviously wow. no room for that sort of thing in football, but to see, uh, to see that actually happening with uh, uh, an ejection happening in the game from one of your wide receivers and still being able to win, they fought through some adversity too. Fought through a pretty tough, raucous uh, crowd as well in Reno. Um, and uh, SMU ended up pulling away with the win, 1-0 and on the year. We'll uh, be sure to check out that. Moving on hey, now. One more thing oh, to yeah, add. Absolutely. Sorry, my apologies. No. Nope. An even more fun thought. Imagine Nevada being that at-large playoff team. <laughs> Maybe they're really good. Yeah. Who knows? I was thinking about it. I mean, watching that this quarterback, he's if he can, you know, not throw the interceptions, protect the football. I mean, he is really freaking good. He made some really good throws throughout this game and uh and made some good decisions on some options as well. And they like to get him involved in that ground game and he was obviously yep. their leading rusher. So that's something to look uh, look at for the for the pack moving forward. And now we'll talk about some teams that maybe will drop out week one. We're looking at really that bottom kind of five, six, seven teams, you know, teams that are in that range where a loss might drop them out. And who's most likely to do that? USC. You think USC is? I, I mean, they do have a tough game against number 13 LSU. They're at, at I, yeah, low enough down. All the field. And they're low enough now that a loss in any sort of manner will probably drop them out of the rankings. Um, and there's obviously teams that will be, you know, gaining some votes this week. Georgia Tech, we already talked about, assuming they take care of business against Georgia State on Saturday, would uh, would definitely be contending for a ranking spot. Uh, and we got Louisville, who's over 100 votes in that uh, that 26 spot. That would be looking to to maybe move up as well. Um, I really put a put a shout here. Texas A&M, you know, playing Notre Dame at home. If they were to lose that game, there's definitely a chance we could see Texas A&M dropping out. Um, mm -hmm. And then I, I, I have to pose questions about Florida State. I know they're going to stay in the poll, but Gavin, where do you think is an appropriate spot for Florida State to be after that loss over in Ireland? Oh, I mean, I probably wouldn't put them on my – ballot you know i think i'd probably drop them out and I, but i think realistically they'll end up somewhere in the 21 to 25 range yeah i mean uh once again i'm not sure where you know how my ballot would stack up obviously we'd have to wait for to see how the games on saturday transpired to, for me to fully answer that but we know florida state's going to stay in this poll assuming they win on monday that's kind of a foregone conclusion they're too high teams don't drop out from that high up in the polls they just don't. So um, that's uh, that would be my opinion. I don't think they're going to drop out. I don't know I don't if I so would either. rank them. I mean, I don't know how you could justify ranking them over Georgia Tech. You um, couldn't. That's the problem. There's Georgia Tech will be 26th or something, and Florida State will be in the top 25. Exactly. And, uh, and, and once again, the AP poll and preseason polls and 
preseason biases strike again. Because if you didn't have Florida State at 10 to start this season off, then you sure as hell shouldn't have them ranked. Exactly. All right, let's talk some games. We got week one coming up. Here's our, our pick standings. We both got those two points last week. Um, so that's something to look at there. Um, yep, uh, my my uh, Florida State pick went up in flames, obviously. Well, and I had Georgia Tech to cover the points, but Florida State winning, so I got one of my points there. And then I had Montana State winning and covering the points. Obviously, Montana State only won. So that's my two points. Gavin nailed that second game. Uh, he picked the correct spread and winner. Had New Mexico covering the points, but Montana State winning. Um, so we're both sitting at two. And we're going to talk about some games that are happening. Well, these are happening before the podcast came out, but just know we are recording this about 45 minutes before kickoff. Correct. So, I mean, I'm just going to go right out here and make my pick, and I'm going to... Give me one second. Okay. My arrow key fell off. There we go. All right. All right. Go again. All right. Yeah, so I'm just going to come straight out here and take my pick. And it's going to be North Dakota State to mm -hmm. win the game. Uh-huh. He likes the Bison. The Bison ranked second in that FCS preseason coaches poll. And once again, 9-4 and four against FBS. Um, you know, North Dakota State beat our Hawkeyes, was obviously, in 2016 at Kinnick Stadium. Mm -hmm. um, they're very, very successful against those, those big-time programs. And here's a fun fact for you. FCS teams this year not doing the helmet communications, also known as the Connor Stallions rule. Um, but when an FCS team is playing an FBS team, they can invest. If they want to invest in the technology, they can do it. North Dakota State invested in the technology. They're, they had this game circled all offseason. Yep. And, and it's certainly not going to be a cakewalk. It's going to be a tough environment. We know uh, Folsom Field was a tough place to play last year. The fans are a factor there. There's a lot of energy around that Colorado program in the, within Boulder and within that fan base. Um, and this is going to be a big test for them. Now, I'm not saying if they win, I think they're going to be, you know, this great team, but it's definitely, you know, a challenge that they have to pass. I am going to take Colorado, and I'm going to take them to cover to 10. I think Colorado passes their first test of the year. I think they take down the Bison in Boulder. Wow. Bold. Bold pick, I think. I think North Dakota State is a monster, and they're prepared like it's the Super Bowl for this game. Mm -hmm. And what's a what's a better target than Colorado? All this all this energy around this program that you talk about that doesn't win you games. I mean, th this team was downright dirty last year, and I think North Dakota State's going to come out and not put up with their nonsense and I think they're they're just going to walk them honestly I think they're going to dominate the clock and they're going to dominate the points and they're going to dominate this game I don't think I, I don't think Dion's going to pull it off I think he's going to fail his test yeah I mean Colorado there's certainly some questions from people outside of the outside of the program but I'm putting my faith in the talent that they have on the field the speed they have on the edge at wide receiver the uh the, the quarterback play that we know you're going to get, you know, from Shadur Sanders, a fantastic quarterback, could have went pro, came back. He's got a fantastic wide receiving core once again. It's going to be up to those up 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 to those offensive linemen if they can give him enough time to make the throws he needs. Or, a, you know, a little bit of that offensive play calling. Can we design plays that have us getting the ball out fast on the edge of the field, taking advantage of our speed in those one-on-one -on -one matchups against what is going to be obviously a slower North Dakota State team. I think they're going to do a good job of that. I like uh, I like Colorado's chances in this game. We've got Minnesota hosting North Carolina, one of the marquee week one non-conference matchups here. Two programs that uh, obviously have uh, been on different paths these last several years. Uh, Minnesota really hasn't been any sort of uh, anything really competitive since that 2019 year where they obviously ended up in that top 10 of that AP poll and uh, to end the season off. North Carolina lost Drake May, who obviously went uh, to the NFL draft. Um, North Carolina coming into a, what is going to be, you know, a, a sold-out stadium 
in Minneapolis. Uh, they had some weather, so they actually this kickoff was pushed back to 8 p.m. Um, so we'll be interesting to see how that affects uh, the effects the way things are going. Yeah, uh, interesting matchup. I think it'll be a fun game, but uh, I mean, Minnesota, the best thing they got going for them is the gopher on the screen, so probably <laughs> going to take North Carolina minus two here. That's a, I think that's an easy pick for me. And I've also got that same pick. I just think that North Carolina, once again, is going to have too much offense for Minnesota to keep up with and contain. Um, Minnesota's going to struggle to score points, lots of question marks at quarterback this year for the gophers. Um, and I think that uh, I think that North Carolina will will take care of business here. Let's talk Saturday. Let's talk one of the biggest games of Saturday, and that's a uh, that's Penn State and number eight Penn State going to Morgantown to take on West Virginia. Yes, one that I, I'm I'm very excited for. I think uh, I mean the stripe out there is phenomenal. I think it's going to be a great energy about the West Virginia team and and the fans are really going to factor into this game. I I'm, I'm I'm interested to see how Penn State can handle this this first challenge. Absolutely. I mean most uh most teams in Penn State's position want to be playing, you know, and what what is to put it bluntly an easy game week 1, you know, whether yeah. that be an FCS team or a Mac school or or just really a, something to make sure that everything's working. What they didn't really want was to be walking into a place that's going to create a really a hostile atmosphere. I mean, this is a mm. tough environment to play in, um, especially uh, when, you know, Fox Big Noon kickoff is going to be there, generating a lot of excitement for that game from the wee early hours of Saturday morning. You mentioned the Stripe the Stadium that they're doing. Uh, and I think that West Virginia has a really good quarterback in Garrett Green. I think he's going to be a difference maker. I think he's going to make – he is going to go out and he is going to beat Penn State and beat Penn State's defense and make plays when he needs to. I have West Virginia money line here, plus uh, obviously covering those eight points. I like the, yeah. the Mountaineers to win this football game. Wow. I mean, there's really no way about it. I think uh, West Virginia – is either going to lose by more than eight or they're going to win the game. So this is making it really tough. That's for me. where I was at as well. That's making it very, very tough for me, but I think I'm going to, I'm going to take the safe pick and I'm going to take Penn state minus eight. Take the Penn state minus eight. Yeah. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how once again, Penn state drew Aller's got a year under his belt of starting now going to be probably one of the tougher environments he's had to face. Um, and I, 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 I like the Mountaineers here. Let's talk some Hawks here. We've got, uh, obviously, the 20th ranked team in FCS Illinois State coming to town. Take it on your 25th ranked Hawk guys. Uh, no Kirk Ferentz on the sidelines. Seth Wallace will be acting head coach. All the decisions will fall on him. Uh, Iowa 20-4 and four in, in season openers under Kirk Ferentz. Uh, interesting fun fact, obviously, Kirk not coaching on Saturday, but still want to put it out there. Iowa favored by 22 and a half. And I have no reason to not take that spread to Iowa covering the 22 and a half. I think that's a very bold take. If I'm being honest, I don't think we can just forget about last year and, and the offensive struggles. I think 22 winning by 22 and a half might be too many. I think I'll probably take Iowa, but I'll take Illinois State to cover that spread. That's an all-time bad take. Cannot wait to roast you about that next week. Okay. Terrible opinion. Terrible take. Absolutely uh, okay. horrifying. Moving well, on, we've got uh, <laughs> a very nice picture of Mario Cristobal oh. over there. <laughs> As his nineteenth ranked, smart. as his nineteenth ranked Hurricanes are going to the swamp, they're walking into a whiteout, taking on the Florida Gators, taking on Billy Napier, a team that that has been rebuilding for the last couple of years. They're looking for some progress here in year three of Billy Napier, looking to make a, a take maybe some sort of leap, start winning some of these games. Obviously, a tough schedule in front of them, 
but you play the schedule that you have and you play the schedule that, that you get. You and uh, Florida's going to have uh, – they're going to have their work cut out for them here. Um, obviously going to be a tough uh, environment uh, to, for Miami to play in. I mean, Florida will they'll have a good home crowd behind them. But uh, the, 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 when you look at the rosters and you stack up these two rosters, there's no question which team is more talented, and it's the Miami Hurricanes. They have more talent. Um, Florida's marching Graham Mertz out at quarterback once again. Um, oh. And and for that, I, I'm going to take the Canes. They've, they're five and two since 2000 in this series. Um, and I like I like Miami going to the swamp, taking care of business here, week one. You know, I'm going to have to disagree with that take because their coach is not an intelligent man. <laughs> this guy managed to lose a football game against Georgia Tech last year when all he had to do was take a knee. take a fucking knee. Game would have ended. And you, you think he's going to rock up to the swamp and take down Florida? I don't think so. I do. Florida to win. All right. He's got the 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 Gators, and, and and our last pick we'll do here of the podcast will be our ABC night game. It'll be number seven Notre Dame traveling to number twenty Texas A and M. Um, the storyline here, obviously, former Duke quarterback Riley Leonard transferred to Notre Dame and will start. Former Duke head coach Mike Elko now the head coach at Texas A and M, and this will be obviously their first game at their new schools. So uh, taking on your former head coach on the road to start the season off. I don't know what the the statistics are there, but this is going to be a, a a challenging environment for Notre Dame to take on. Um, going to be tough for them to to like I said, Riley Leonard having to play his old head coach. Um, there's obviously you know a, a, a different kind of relationship between coach and player, and, and and we don't know the specifics if they ended on a high note, ended on a low note. But he didn't follow his coach to, to Texas A&M. He chose a different route to go to Notre Dame, and now he'll get a chance to prove it here at Kyle Field at 6.30 on Saturday. Gavin, who do you got in this game? I think I got Texas A&M. I think, I think Vegas is calling this one exactly correct. I mean, Riley Leonard is going to get read like a book, and they're just they're just going to – they're just going to beat them. I think Notre Dame is another fraudulent top 10 to start the season, and they're probably going to lose this game. I um I also have Texas A&M, uh, and I have them covering the three. I think I wouldn't be surprised if they won by three, though. Uh, I think this is going to be a close game. Um, yep. I don't think Texas A&M is fully ready to take that next step yet under Mike Elko in his first year. I think that he needs a little bit more time to establish uh, you know, the culture that he needs and bring in the recruits he needs. But I will say this. I think that the, me picking them is more of a testament to doubting Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame on the road mm-hmm. in a game like this um, yep. where we know that Notre Dame struggles winning these big games. And starting off the year with one is not the ideal scenario for the Fighting Irish. And uh, I think they're going to start the year on a wrong note. I think Texas A&M is going to win this, jump extremely far into polls, and go 8-4. and four. Correct. Great call. Thank you. And we're going to close this out here. We're going to talk about upset. Upsets, upsets, upsets. Who has the best chance of being upset this week? And we don't have to necessarily just choose from these schools, but these are all schools that I think are, uh, have a chance to be on a heightened upset alert. You got Colorado playing North Dakota State, Oklahoma State taking on South Dakota State. Boise State goes on the road to play Georgia Southern. Georgia taking on Clemson and Charlotte. Do I think Georgia's going to win lose that game? No, but no. they definitely they definitely 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 need to not sleepwalk through it. That is 100% something that they cannot afford to do. And we didn't touch on this game because I don't think either Gavin or I would be interested in taking anything other than Georgia and the points. But if Georgia comes out and they're sleepwalking and let Clemson take some sort of lead, Clemson's defense is fiery. And I think that Georgia needs to make sure that they, they start strong and take control and play the game at their pace. If yep. Georgia is able to play the game at their pace, they will never lose a football game. That's just how Georgia is. They're a machine. Correct. 
Yeah. Arizona no State takes on Wyoming at home. That's a, a game that I think Arizona State could lose in their first game as a Big 12 team. Penn State going to Morgantown as an eight-point favorite. Northwestern hosting Miami, Ohio, only a three-point favorite. We know Miami, Ohio, one of the better schools from the MAC. Um, and we'll be interested to see if the, the, the temporary stadium Northwestern will be rocking with, if that has any sort of impact on the, on the, the competition. I mean, they already play games with no fans. I think the stadium isn't really a factor. I think you could put them on any field and they'll perform in exactly the same manner. So, well, I, The one thing I want to point out, this thing is on Lake Michigan's banks. It is on the shore. If you've ever been to Chicago when it's windy, You'll know how that wind starts coming in across of the or swirling off of the lake, around. swirling around. Strong winds too, definitely could make certain aspects of Northwestern games interesting, especially special teams. So it's it's a unique advantage or not even an advantage, just a unique uh, kind of atmosphere that they're gonna have in their uh, in their temporary stadium. You know, fans or no fans, with dealing with weather like that. You know, if it's an overcast, windy day in Chicago. Under betters, you might want to take a peek. Fuel goals might not be automatic. It could affect things like that. Great shot there. It's going to be a fun game to watch. Yeah, absolutely. So we got a lot of fun games to watch. Gavin, obviously, will be at Kinnick Stadium. I will. On Saturday for Illinois State. We will try to get a uh, reaction podcast out for you on Sunday where we will preview the USC LSU game, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Hawks, and uh, and talk a little bit about obviously that team out west that we have to take on the week after. But for now, this is our Week One preview podcast. Um, we made some picks. Uh, we're excited for college football to be back, and we hope you guys are too. And if you're as excited as I am, you're gonna want to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. You're going to want to have friend. exactly. You're going to want to have the back on black podcast on to not only give you some insights into into college football games around the land, but to also hear the latest news about your Hawks, maybe hear things from a different perspective. And and that's what we're looking to do. Talking about the Big 10 as well. Any Big 10 fans that are listening to this, you want to know what's going on over in Iowa City, guys. You're going to want to keep tabs on us. We're gonna be a we're gonna be a tougher game than you think. That's for sure. Uh, it's all you new Big Ten teams out there, fans of new Big Ten teams. It ain't gonna be the cakewalk you think it is. <coughs> USC. <coughs> huh. So, it's just something to think about. And with that, this has been Rodney. And Gavin. And uh, we'll uh, we'll sign off on this. See you guys all later. Take care.